Bill Lawrence. We all set? All right, I got the head, the head nod from Brother Lawrence, so we're good to go. If you open your Bibles to Acts 15, please. We'll be in Acts 15 for the first few slides of our lesson for this morning, uh, and then we're going to get more into Saul's, or excuse me, Paul's second preaching trip. I think I mentioned last week that I'm going to try to not name slip, and I already did this morning. Hopefully that's the last time that'll happen. We'll begin with some review of our 17 time periods. We're obviously getting very close to the end of that. In fact, kind of overlapping now at this point of the days of the early church and then the letters to the Christians, our last two that are on there. But I think still helpful for us to remember all the ground that we've covered and where we are right now as well. So let's start by repeating these time periods together, and then we'll have a word of prayer and we'll get into our class this morning. Before I turn the slide, can we do the first few from memory? Number one, before the flood. Number two, the flood. Number three, scattering of the people. Number four, patriarchs. Let's see if we can help you out this morning now, if I get this to advance for me. Uh, number five, the Exodus, very good. Number six, wandering in the wilderness. Number seven, invasion and conquest of the land. Number eight, judges. Number nine, united kingdom. Number 10, divided kingdom. Number 11, Judah alone. Number 12, captivity. Number 13, return from captivity. Number 14, the years of silence. Uh, number 15, life of Christ, and number 16, the early church. There we go. I think we're getting a little bit of a quicker response now. And 17 letters of Christian. I stopped early then. And I'm, thank you, Tracy. Number 16 is the early church. Number 17, letters to Christians. All right. So from here, we're going to move into Paul's second missionary journey or Paul's second preaching trip and looking at the places that he's gone and kind of some events leading to this particular event as well. Like I mentioned, if you have your Bible open to Acts chapter 15, I'm pretty confident we're going to be staying exclusively in Acts 15 through Acts 18 this morning. There are some other references to the book of Galatians a little bit. There are some references to 1 and 2 Thessalonians, a couple other passages that are talked about within our material. But for the most part, I'm thinking we're going to stay pretty much right here in Acts 15 through Acts 18. So if you've got your Bible open to there, you'll be set and ready to follow along. For our study this morning. We're in that time period of the early church and that time period of the letters to Christians as Paul is doing his work and now in the second journey starting to write some of those letters to places like Thessalonica and we'll see other places like Galatia and Corinth that are talked about today. Ephesus is talked about today. Not necessarily saying he wrote those letters in this exact time period but we're getting around to all that time together. But before we continue on with our study of the history and geography of the Bible story and seeing how God has unfolded this plan, how God has uh, helped His kingdom to continue to spread to the end of the earth, then we'll go ahead and have a word of prayer. If you'll pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this day that you have blessed us with. We're grateful for this chance we have to honor you, our great and awesome God. We're thankful for... Uh, all that you do to provide for us and creating us and sustaining us each and every day. We're especially grateful for the rain you have sent our way and for this cooler weather and remembering that not all days are like that as we've been enjoying the sunshine and some warmer weather the past few days as well. We thank you for the reminder of the beauty of seasons and the wisdom that we see in the world around us and your creation as it's just a reflection of the great and powerful and wise and awesome God that you are. We're thankful for your word that helps us to see how you brought about the plan of salvation, how you have sent your son to this earth and you have brought his kingdom and as his kingdom continues to spread and as he continues to reign, may we be encouraged to see the work that is done here in the first century as we want to model the lives of the church and the Christians then and continue to help that church spread and help your kingdom spread even here 2,000 years later in our part of the world. We're so thankful for the church that works together here we're thankful for uh, those of us who are here in this class this morning and for all of our other teachers and students today. We pray that you watch over us and help us to draw closer to you through our time in this hour. We pray that you'll be with those who are sick, uh, with those who have sick ones at home that they're taking care of, with those who have been going, struggling with ongoing sickness, that you'll be with them and watch over them uh, 
as there may have been many that have been sick or getting sick again, we pray that you'll watch over them and, and just be with them that they'll be with us again soon. We're thankful for the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior Jesus and, and through studies like this of seeing the, the word spread and seeing the power of the word and the power of the gospel may be encouraging for us as we want to understand the gospel and live the gospel, proclaim the gospel through our lives as well. We're so thankful for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through whom we find forgiveness of sins. It's in his name that we humbly pray. Amen. I mentioned we're going to be in Acts chapter 15. Uh, if you're looking at the screen, this red line that you notice is Paul's second trip being outlined. And you can hopefully kind of tell over on the far right side around Antioch of Syria. I left my laser pointer in my office again, so I'm just going to point very emphatically. And hopefully you can see how that continues to spread along. But around that, he goes through the land this time. As opposed to, do you remember where Paul's first few stops were with Barnabas on his first trip? Where did he go? Did he go by land or by sea? By sea to the land, the island of Cyprus, and eventually getting up into Pamphylia around uh, Pergia and moving towards into Galatia a little bit there. So we're going to see a different route this time. We'll see why we're maybe looking at a different route as we'll get to the end of Acts chapter 15. But Acts chapter 15, we're picking up the very end of Paul's previous journey and some events that take place between his first and second journey. Overall, his first journey, uh, this is a very simple question for a much more complex topic, but how would you describe Paul's first journey? Good, bad, both, why? How was Paul's first preaching trip, his first missionary journey? There was, from one perspective, and I'm sure he... That's right, I think that Miss Julie is absolutely right that there's, it's not really a simple, it was good or it was bad, it was... A mixture of there was lots of good being done as he's preaching the gospel and Jews are believing it. We're seeing large amounts of Gentiles who are coming to believe the gospel, something that we haven't really seen before. It's amazing to see what's being accomplished. But with that preaching of the gospel, there are people who are not so thrilled about the preaching of the gospel. And so Paul is getting into trouble with them, not because he's doing something wrong, but because they don't like what he's doing. And when Paul gets into trouble with these people, are they just, you know, throwing tomatoes like people do at bad comedians? Uh, they're not throwing tomatoes. They're throwing other things, aren't they? Sometimes stones. They're driving him out of town. He's having to leave places uh, maybe sooner than expected, but continuing to do the Lord's work along the way. And so at the end of chapter 14, uh, they're back at Antioch. In verse 27 of Acts 14, they arrived and gathered the church together, declared all that God had done with them and how it opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And there remained no little time with the disciples. And I imagine that Antioch is very excited about this. They're thrilled by the fact that Gentiles are coming to the faith as well. But as we get into Acts chapter 15, we'll have this uh, chapter, this main part of this chapter, by what we call the Council in Jerusalem. Or maybe you've heard the Jerusalem Council. Now, in church history, broadly over the past 2,000 years, there have been different times in church history you've had a council of such and such. Maybe the Council of Nicaea sticks in your mind is something you've heard before. Uh, literally every other one has vanished from my mind just now. I know I've heard of at least a couple others, but you've heard of maybe some of these places. Tracy, you have anything from old history, any of those? The Council of Trent is in my history. There you go. That's another one where you get these, these church leaders, these church fathers who are getting together, and they're talking about maybe canon of Scripture. They're talking about what doctrines do we believe or don't we believe? And these are men who are getting together to have these conversations. That is very different from what we're seeing in the first century in the early days of the church. It's a similar sounding thing. You have a Council of Tent, a Council of Nicaea. They're talking Bible. In a way, the Council of Jerusalem is talking Bible, but there's a very different aspect that we'll notice at the end of this letter that they send in just a moment. So, Paul and Barnabas, they're at Antioch, they're talking about how great things have been and the fact that Gentiles are coming to the faith and they're excited about that. Yes, there were maybe some trip-ups along the way, but things are good overall for the message of the gospel that's continuing to spread. 
Uh, as is mentioned here, it's about 10 years since the conversion of Cornelius, the first Gentile uh, that we read about in Acts chapter 10. Judean brethren in Acts chapter 15 come to Antioch, uh, and you see it on the screen here, but what is their main issue with hearing about what these guys, Paul and Barnabas, have been doing? News apparently has spread that Paul and Barnabas have been going around and they're teaching Gentiles. They're teaching Gentiles to become Christians, but what are they not doing that the Jews expect them to do? They're expecting to tell these Gentiles, you know, Jesus is great, we love Jesus, he's our Lord and Savior, of course, of course, blah, blah, blah. But you've got to keep the law of Moses, too. And that being talked about most often through the, the, um, the context of circumcision, whether someone needs to be circumcised, keep that law or not. Tracy? And they were clear about this. The message was first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles, as if, and I think the Jews took that as if we're Jews first. And then we became Christian. So therefore, you guys gonna have to become Jew, and then you become the access to Christianity was through Judaism. That's right, and I think that's absolutely the idea that they're promoting and trying to say is that in order to be saved by Jesus, you know, we're the distinct, separate people that God called, and so you have to follow our ways and then find your way to Jesus, which the gospel that Jesus preached and the gospel that his disciples and apostles preached was not become a Jew and then become a follower of me. It is true that Jesus, while he was on this earth and in his ministry and having his apostles and disciples go out and teach and preach, he said, go to the lost sheep in Israel, go to the house of Israel, and at times did limit his disciples to not go to Phoenicia or to Samaria or to the Gentiles. But when Jesus is getting ready to leave this earth, what does he tell his disciples? He's not about to restore the kingdom in Israel and in Jerusalem. He is about to have this kingdom to spread, he tells his disciples to go to all nations, all of the world, everyone is to be a part of this kingdom now. And the Jews aren't crazy about that. And so there's this big discussion that ends up taking place. Uh, they eventually, it starts off at Antioch as some of these people from Judea go down to uh, Antioch. Uh, as you read that in scripture at time, you notice that they travel north, but they go down why are they going down to Antioch from Jerusalem? Because of elevation. That's right, Jerusalem's on a mountain, so anytime you see going down, but they're traveling north, or they're going up to Jerusalem from as they're heading south, talking about elevation here that Luke is noticing in Acts. They get to this council in Jerusalem. Uh, they're talking about different things of, do you have to be a Jew before you can be a Christian? Uh, Jerusalem Church is the center of Christianity among this time. Antioch Church was the center of uh, Christianity among the Gentiles, one might say. And so the discussion of circumcision, and particularly it seems about this guy named Titus, is brought up. We read about that more in Acts chapter, or Galatians chapter 2, verse 3 and verse 5, but I want to catch Acts chapter 15 and verse 5. Some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. The whole point about these Gentile Christians here is not can they or can they not be Christians, it's they have to follow the law of Moses too. And Galatians and Romans, when Paul writes those letters eventually, is mostly combating that idea of this Jesus and something else business is not what the gospel is. That is another gospel that Paul talks about in the beginning of Galatians. We see that today as well. We'll see oftentimes people taking Jesus and man-made doctrine, Jesus and a little bit of Eastern religion mixed in as well, Jesus and anything else. Anytime that we start to get Jesus and, Jesus and Jeff O'Rear doctrine, Jeff O'Rear may think about how he applies some things and may understand how he makes those things apply, but if I'm teaching things that are from me and original with me as doctrine that's equal to what Jesus says, I've straight from the gospel, and that's what these people are doing at this time as well. There's a couple of slides here that talk about the circumcision of Titus. Um, Titus was a Gentile Christian, yet he was not required to be circumcised. That's the point Paul makes in Galatians chapter 2, as he's especially combating that. Do we remember, though, another Gentile Christian who Paul does circumcise? Does this sound familiar? We'll read about him in Acts chapter 16 in just a second. Timothy? It is Timothy. Uh, 
No, I'm not going to go. I'm not going to go down that hole. I think it comes up here in just a moment. So you see that Titus is not required to be circumcised, and Paul brings up that point. Timothy, however, is circumcised, but that's because of his Jewish mother. He's been raised a Jew, and probably because of some of the influence things. Paul is encouraging J Timothy here because he will interact with some Jews. Uh, not so much of a strict requirement to be saved, but Paul says there's no harm if you do this. If you're going to say that this guy, Titus, though, has to be circumcised to be a Christian, Paul's going to take issue with that, and he's going to fight against that. So what maybe seems like contradictory intentions or motives from Paul are not contradictory issues. They're more of how Paul's approaching the issue of salvation relating to the law. And so at the council in Acts chapter 15, you have speeches given by different types of people. Uh, you have Peter, this being Peter's last time that we hear from him in the book of Acts. You have Paul and Barnabas both talking as well and just kind of giving one verse attributed to them. In Acts chapter 15 and verse 12, all the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas and Paul and they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. This idea of Gentiles are being welcomed to the kingdom just as much as anybody else. And so that needs to be noted and that example needs to be made aware of. And James, the brother of the Lord, speaking here in Acts chapter 15 as well, making some references to Scripture and seeing the impact in all of this. So in Acts chapter 15, as Peter and Paul and Barnabas and James, and I'm assuming probably some others, and even some others on the other side, have this discussion, what's ultimately the conclusion that this, I'm going to say for now, council comes to in Acts chapter 15? Does somebody have to become a Jew to become a Christian? No, they make that distinction. And so what do they do? How are they going to uh, help others understand this, particularly maybe churches that are in strong Gentile territory? They're going to write a letter to them, right? We have that letter recorded for us. We see starting in verse 23, the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia, kind of first of all, going through and talking about the fact that it seems good to us, verse 25, to one accord, to choose men and send them to you, our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Uh, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas as well, who will say the same things by word of mouth. Verse 29, that you abstain from what, is not, or from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, from what has been strangled and from sexual morality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Uh, in verse 28, talking about the fact that there's no reason for us to put further burdens on you. We're not going to make you keep the law of Moses in order to be saved Christians because there's no reason for that. But when they come to this decision, this is the difference between the Council of Nicaea and the Council of Trent and what happens at the Council of Jerusalem. In verse 28, who is making that declaration? Yes, the apostles and the, prophet, or the uh, elders in Jerusalem, kind of this key area are writing this letter and putting their names to it, but who's the one who's behind this teaching? The Holy Spirit is the one who's... In, that's super important for us to notice. Notice, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm choking on my spit. To help us to notice there in verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. We recognize the Spirit is approving of this, that you do not need to become Jews nor to be Christian. So this letter is sent out, as it's read over uh, Syria and Cilicia, people are hearing about it. Uh, the letters proclaimed by Silas and Ju uh, Judas and Barnabas and Paul. People are excited. Uh, Gentiles are excited to hear about all of this and the news that is coming. And so we see then uh, Paul and Barnabas getting ready to go on our next missionary journey. Uh, this is going to lay some groundwork as they continue to preach to Gentiles, and they'll continue to probably proclaim this message. Although, does this issue ever go away? I mean, the Holy Spirit and the apostles and the elders of Jerusalem signed a letter, and so there'll just never be any issue with Judaizing teachers ever again. Incorrect. Incorrect. You all read Acts 16, Acts 17, and Acts 18, whether for today or before, and see that the Jews are still causing problems. And it seems to be problems with, again, this issue, struggling to accept what God's will really is on all of this. Have we finished our map yet? We did. All right, so you can get a picture of what Paul's trip's going to look like. Again, choosing to go through land here at this point rather than starting out by sea. Uh, we'll get a list of the cities that he visits. But let's get more into now talking about the places that Paul goes and some of the work that he does there.
Again, the history and geography class, this is not so much of a content of stopping at each location and spending seven minutes about who all was there and what all happened and every detail of all of it, but getting the picture and idea about the work that's being done as the kingdom is spreading to the ends of the earth. Do you remember in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8? Chapter 1 and verse 8, Jesus tells his apostles that you'll be my witnesses first in Jerusalem and then Judea and Samaria. And then after Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, the gospel will spread to the end of the earth or to the ends of the world. And we're seeing that happen through the rest of Acts, through what Paul, or excuse me, what Peter has somewhat started with the conversion of Cornelius, but what Paul and Barnabas and Paul and Silas and Timothy and other people do, particularly through their work as well. So speaking of Paul and Barnabas, uh, Paul and Barnabas worked really well together on the first trip, it seems. They went through some challenges, but they overcame them, and they preached the gospel, and people converted to that gospel, and that's a wonderful thing. And so Paul thinks, hey, we should do a little bit more of that, Barnabas, so let's go out, and let's do some more of that preaching. What's Paul's original intent about going out on this second trip? Originally, when he leaves, or wants to leave in verse 36, what does he say? Let us, in Acts 15, 36, return and visit those brothers in every city we proclaim the word and see how they are. His first thought is, let's go back to these people and continue to encourage them, continue to give them teaching. Paul and we see it in his letters, but we see it very clearly in Acts 2. Paul is very much a people person. Paul is not just going to get you wet and then leave you out to dry on the line down the road. Paul very much cares for the Christians, for the churches, for the people and the souls that he preaches to and that he has taught the gospel. He wants them to stand firm. They've seen the type of stuff that he goes through. He's probably heard by this point some of the stuff that they're starting to go through, as we'll see either before this trip or after this trip, how some of these are fairly young Christians and young churches, and they're already facing hard persecution, and Paul wants them to stand firm in the faith. And so Paul decides to visit those congregations he's helped establish. Uh, and so Barnabas says, all right, let's go, you, me, and John Mark. We'll bring along my cousin or my nephew, depending on uh, some of the manuscript evidence with all of that, my relative, John Mark, as well. Briefly, uh, do they take John Mark? No, there's some dis disagreement there. It seems that maybe Paul is unsure about having the one who deserted them on the first trip and having him come again. Barnabas really wants to take this young man with him. And so we see a separation here at this point. Just to say the fact that Paul and Barnabas separate that, Paul takes Silas and leaves toward Tarsus. Uh, while we don't have reference of a church being established there from the first trip, uh, maybe working through there, maybe that there is a church there. Paul and Bar or, uh, Barnabas and John Mark go to Cyprus, go back to their homeland, are going to do some work there. We leave Barnabas and John Mark. Does that mean that they're now the bad guys in the story of Acts? No, but it was heated. It was, uh... it was heated. It was enough for them to get over. I mean, Barnabas is the son of encouragement, but it was enough for Barnabas to say, hey, let's just go our separate ways in this moment. But Barnabas and John Mark are still doing the work of the gospel. True, and they do come back together, and it works. The, whatever's between them, it gets settled. We see in Colossians and in Philemon, we see Mark and Barnabas talk about in some of the letters where Paul obviously names him as a brother. Names him as a brother. I, I'm hesitant to say got over things. I understand that there's tension. That's what I mean by that. I don't mean that there are just you know two toddlers fighting each other and throwing fits. And there's, there's issues about how we're going to accomplish the will and the work of God. Or not the will of God, the work of God in this. I think this is a, an opinionated matter. And so they are willing to, able to get over all of that, and they can go to work. So Barnabas and Mark head towards Cyprus, but Paul and Silas are going to start heading towards some of the churches they've been to before. So some of the first places they stop are Derby and Lystra. Remember them from Acts chapter 14, where Paul uh, was stoned? Who do they pick up here in Derby and Lystra in Acts chapter 16. Timothy. Timothy, bring him on board. It's very likely that Paul taught Timothy, or at least Timothy's mother and grandmother, the gospel in his last time that he was there. And from that point, Timothy is converted and now has heard about the good reputation and the good work of Timothy and brings him along as well. 
and circumcises him as well in getting ready to go on this trip. Not because he's required to, but because he thinks it will be helpful and beneficial within that work. So Timothy joins the team at this point, and then they start heading towards where? Galatia. Phrygia. That's all right. I was asking for you. Feel free to answer, Glow. So, all right. So we're heading towards Phrygia and Galatia. Uh, as they're going along this way, they're talking about the things that were talked about in Jerusalem. Uh, the degrees from Jerusalem are delivered. Uh, Paul is attacked by sickness that we can read about in Galatians chapter 4. Where does Paul want to go from Phrygia and Galatia? As we get down towards verse 6. Asia. He wants to go to Asia, but he's forbidden in this particular moment. And so Paul, in that moment, being forbidden to going more into Asia, maybe heading more north, northeast at this particular moment, says, I'm going to keep, keep moving. He doesn't just stop and give up and go home. He continues to do work, and he ends up heading towards Troas. Uh, at Troas, he receives what we call the... The Macedonian call. There, you can probably see that around verse 10, uh, verse 7, around this particular area. Uh, they come to Mysia, Bithynia, uh, and Macedonia. Verse 9, verse 10, he has this dream or this vision, and this man is saying, come and help us. And so along this point, Luke is going to join the scene in verse 11, setting sail from Troas. Who? Not Paul and Barnabas, not they. In verse 11, we are going on this trip. So Luke's on the scene for a bit. He's going to be with Paul and Silas. I might have said Barnabas a moment ago. If I did, excuse me for that. Paul and Silas and Timothy on this trip for the time being, heading into Macedonia. They stop off at Neapolis and then head a little bit more inland in just a little bit. I've got to keep up with my map there. And where do they go in Acts chapter 16, starting around verse 12? In Philippi. Uh, they're heading to Philippi. Uh, they get to Philippi. Where does Paul normally go when he gets to a new city? First, makes a stop at a, a synagogue. Doesn't do that this time in Philippi. Apparently there aren't ten Jewish men for a synagogue to be there. So he goes to the... The riverside, where there is a place of prayer, or some place that Jews seem to gather together and, and pray. Uh, at this place, a particular woman that we know is converted, Lydia. We read about her and her faith. Uh, Philippi is a great success story to see the beginning of Lydia, and there's another conversion we'll talk about. But again, like Miss Julia mentioned, like we talked about for the first preaching trip, it's not just good or just bad, but there's kind of this mixture of both. Things are good. You've seen the conversion of Lydia and her household. What's that followed up by after Paul and Silas and Timothy are pestered by this little girl? And that's a gross understatement of the whole story there. But what happens to them? What did we build over here last summer? Uh, a, a perfectly constructed sound jail over there in that corner for our VBS that was, I think, post-earthquake. Wasn't it what we said? Very much post-earthquake that we read about in here. But while they're in prison, they're singing hymns. Maybe if you were here for our VBS, you remember hearing Paul and Silas singing their hymns. Uh, and eventually leading to the conversion of the jailer. Obviously, Philippians will later be written to the brethren who meet there. Uh, just some quick things about Philippi, and I do mean quick, just in regard to the fact that you can see some things about the colony there. Uh, it's a Roman colony, thought of as an extension of Rome, so probably given some thoughts and benefits that other places didn't. As they're moving into Macedonia, moving into Philippi, they're getting closer and closer to deep Greek thought, more Greek culture. At this point, Greek culture has spread over this particular area and the, the east that we're in and looking at for this class. But they're getting closer and closer to that. And what are some things we've noticed about the Greek culture? That they're very willing to talk about different thoughts and opinions and ways. We'll get to some of that in just a moment when we get to Athens. Uh, but they're definitely into the heart of that Hellenistic influence of the empire. Um, again, some things about prop only a few for a synagogue um, is definitely stuck in Greek culture. From Philippi, in Acts chapter 17, they move on to... Thessalonica. Uh, Thessalonica, Paul's going to write what letters to them later? It's not Galatians, it's 
First and Second Thessalonians, not trick questions for that one this morning. Feel free to follow along there. Uh, this is the largest city in Macedonia. When Paul goes to Thessalonica, things fare similarly to what we've seen in other places. He goes to a synagogue. He reasons with them from the Scripture. He doesn't just make up stuff off the top of his head, but he reasons to say it's reasonable to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and I want to show you that, that it's reasonable. I'm not just going to blindly have you to join my work and to join what my faith is. I want to show you this. And so some Jews do believe, but not just Jews, but kind of a larger percentage of Gentiles are talked about there. Uh, you have in Acts chapter 17 and verse... For uh, some of them, that being the Jews, were persuaded to join Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. But similarly to other places, when Paul is in Thessalonica, you've got some Jews and you've got maybe a larger number of Gentiles joining on. That's wonderful. But who else is there? Unbelieving Jews. Unbelieving Jews. These Judaizing teachers, it seems, who are, again, those folks who either just outright disregard Jesus or saying, if you're going to really be a Christian, you've got to be a Jew first, not in line with what Paul is teaching. And so uh, Paul and Silas are drawn out of town. It's around this time that Luke's going to drop out of the scene for a little while as well. Uh, from there, Paul and Silas and most likely Timothy go to Berea. What's our statement we always remember about Berea in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, about those Jews in, Bele in Berea as opposed to the Jews in Thessalonica. They're minded. They're minded. Fair-minded. Fair -minded. You said they're minded. Fair -minded. They are fair-minded. Why? Because they search the Scriptures. They're following along what Paul is saying. This morning, when I'm preaching about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, I'm going to talk about it in my introduction, but even more so, I need you to follow along with me Make sure what I'm preaching is truth and that you all can follow and make sure that I'm preaching truth as well. Whether it's that topic or anything from Scripture. That's what these Jews do here. Uh, poor Thessalonica kind of getting some shade thrown at them here in this particular verse. But overall, a very strong church that we'll see later on as Paul writes his letters to them. However, as Paul is in Berea, and as we see that key scripture of them uh, recognizing and searching the scriptures daily and seeing what Paul had to say was true and believing that, it's not just the noble Jews that are there, but who else is there? Those troublemaking Jews have followed him from Thessalonica. Paul's followers are not leaving him from place to, or leaving with him from place to place, you know, taking up shop and going with him. He's establishing churches and encouraging people to stay where they are to have communities of Christians. But you're going to have people who are following Paul, these unbelieving Jews. Uh, the brethren there send Paul away by the sea. And eventually Paul is going to find himself where? In Acts chapter 17. In Athens. Uh, particularly as you can follow the line here that's being drawn down when I click the slide in just a second. Uh, Athens is kind of known for, and that's a very broad question, but when you look at Acts chapter 17, I'll give you some help. Uh, there you go. Tracy knows. The idea that they're philosophers. They love just any and all kinds of philosophy. There's lots of, not just philosophers, but lots of images, idols that are there. That people, whether they truly worship or just kind of a representation of all the thought and culture that they've blended together in this moment. And Paul's going to go from there and tell them about uh, the true God and tell them about Jesus. He preaches in synagogues. He preaches to devout people. He'll talk with people who are in the marketplace. He talks with those philosophers at Mars Hill, as we call it. Um, when he gets to Athens and when he preaches in Athens... He talks about, you know, starting with a more general base. He doesn't start with the scriptures. He goes back to the beginning and said, this unknown God, let me tell you about him. And let's talk about how he made you and sustains you and how he has brought you here to where you are. I'll even quote some of your philosophers along the way to see how they're, whether they realize it or not, talking about the way that God runs his universe and organizes his universe. But from there, I'm going to tell you about this guy, Jesus. And when Paul talks about Jesus... How do the people in Athens respond? Overall, it seems not well. You've kind of got an, an obvious no. Why do the people in Athens think Paul is 
crazy. In verse 32, some mock him. Why? Acts 17, 32. The resurrection is just crazy to them. People don't come back from the dead. I mean, that's like, you know, mythology kind of stuff. But I think that that Paul has been, you know, making well-crafted arguments, and now he speaks this as if it's truth, that people come back from the dead. You're stupid, Paul. That's how some people respond in Athens. Some people are on the fence. They're interested, but they're not really convinced one way or another. Maybe they'll become Christians. Maybe they won't. Uh, I don't really know what to do with that yet. But there are some people, only a few are named, but a few are converted as well. Verse 34, some joined him and believed. Acts 17 is just a great chapter about how people receive the gospel, whether you just focus on the time in Athens, whether you focus about these three different cities, you see how people respond to the gospel. They either follow along and see how reasonable it is because they've been examining themselves and are testing these things and trusting these things. Some people are kind of on the fence, and especially the unbelieving Jews in Thessalonica are the ones who say, if it's not what I've heard from the law of Moses, I don't want it. If it's not what I already know, I'm not going to pay attention to it. And some people are going to say, if it's new, but if it's too new, I'll listen to it, but I'm not going to receive that as well. Some people will mock. Some people will live their life on the fence. Some people will become devoted to it. There's lots of great idea about the reception of the gospel as we're preaching and teaching others the gospel to understand and to know about how people respond to that message here throughout Acts chapter 17. Uh, Moving to our next slide, getting back to some map stuff. Paul goes from Athens to to Corinth, as we're in Acts chapter 18 now, in our last few minutes of class this morning. Athens is very philosophical. It's kind of a center for thought and for thinking and philosophy. There is lots of images and some idolatry there, Uh, but when you think of if Athens is the center of philosophy and thought, Corinth is the center of commerce and trade, and what often comes with that. There's lots of trade, there's lots of commerce, there's lots of migration. It's good. This is all great stuff. I'm, I'm Money? Say it, Danny. Evil people. Evil people. Morally corrupt people. That's not a blanket statement for everybody, but there are thoughts, as you can read in Scripture and even outside of Scripture, about Corinth just being kind of just the scum buckets of the world. That's probably not a great term. I would not go up to somebody and say, you're a scum bucket, but that's how they're kind of portrayed as being evil and corrupt and immoral. And Paul goes to that place, and Paul is going to teach people about Jesus in that place, and... We might say surprising, but we should probably say unsurprising by this point. Some people believe him. Is there conflict along the way in the one and a half years he's in Corinth? For sure there is. But people, even in the most immoral of places that's been talked about, and that's kind of a vague term, but we understand that, are also believing and accepting the gospel. You have this terrible moral climate, but but Paul is being preaching, or is preaching about Jesus in the synagogue for a while, and eventually is finding somewhere else to preach. Um, you see that justice is converted uh, in Acts chapter 18 and verse 7. He left there and went to the house of a man named Justice, a worshiper of God, who was next door to the synagogue. You have later on Crispus, who, if I remember right, is uh, verse 8, uh, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord. So you have people who live next to the synagogue. Maybe Justice is or isn't a Jew. You have Crispus, who is a ruler of the synagogue, definitely a Jew, leaving that idea of Jew-only mentality behind is saying that Jesus is the Lord. Uh, When he's in Corinth, uh, he starts off there alone. Remember, he had to leave Berea very quickly and was alone in Athens for all or at least most of the time. Uh, But when he gets to Corinth, who joins him once again? A couple of answers you could give to this. I'm looking for two pairs of people. When he gets to Corinth, he meets a particular couple, a husband and wife, Aquila and Priscilla, and they... Uh, strike up bonds and work together, not just because of you know, the gospel, but because they share similar work as well as tent makers. Uh, but who comes later to Corinth and meets Paul again on this trip? A young guy named Timothy and an, 
probably older guy named Silas who had been with him, who left for a while. When you look at First, first Thessalonians particularly, it seems maybe Timothy went back to Thessalonica for a while to check on them as they're facing persecution, probably concerning that Paul was run out of town and there was you know, even persecution that was going on as he was leaving town. Uh, but the brethren, uh, Timothy reports, are doing well. Uh, working with uh, Priscilla and Aquila, uh, Paul taught regularly and was definitely encouraged as Timothy and Silas came back on the scene again. So from Corinth, Paul is going to go where? In Acts chapter 18, verse 19, verse 21. We get a larger section of teaching and stuff about Corinth. He goes to Ephesus. Ephesus is probably one of the most detailed churches we have besides Jerusalem. As you think about First and Second Timothy relate to Ephesus. John talks to Ephesus for a little bit. There's the Ephesian letter, which might have been a circulatory letter, but has some things related to Ephesus. You'll see more about Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. But he goes there to Ephesus, uh, stays there for a little while, preaches in the synagogue. But eventually in verse 21, what does he tell the Ephesians? I want to go to Jerusalem, but uh, Lord willing, I'll come back, and we'll have more interaction. I mean, you think about Acts chapter 20, uh, where he meets with the Ephesian elders. Paul definitely has a close connection with this church. One of the longest days we have recorded for us in Scripture is Paul's at Ephesus. This is beyond today's specific material, but do you remember how long Paul was at Ephesus? Three, and a half years. three to three and a half years in that time period. And he's staying there, as opposed to some of these places he's there three to four months, maybe at most, like Thessalonica, maybe even just three weeks, depending on how you read the Sabbath talked about in there. Uh, a year and a half at Corinth, maybe some shorter times at some of these places. And he's there with that church for a while. He's established some contact there, but he's leaving on, and Priscilla and Aquila are going to stay behind. He goes to Caesarea, most likely wanting to get back to Jerusalem. Uh, so, from what we have recorded for us, he makes his way back to Jerusalem, and then it ends... In Acts chapter 18, verse 22, uh, he landed at Caesarea. He went up and greeted the church. That's probably talking about the church of Jerusalem. And then he goes from there to Antioch. And there we have the conclusion of our second missionary journey. Some information about this journey lasted three years. Visited large districts of Asia Minor. Visited European cities. This is the first time Paul's made it over to that area. Jews are violently resisting him in most every place that he goes. Um, we talked about Thessalonica and Berea. Uh, don't really talk about Jew conflict at Athens, but conflict in Corinth as well. We'll see conflict in, uh, from Gentile and Jew, I believe, in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 soon. Congregations are established in several places along the way. 2,700 miles by sea and by land. Remember, Paul is not on a speedboat and taking airplanes on this trip. He is traveling and walking and riding, you know, probably trade ships along the way. Miss Julia? I was just going to say that those 1,400 miles by land are basically on foot. Right. I mean, maybe he had a riding animal at times, potentially. I don't know. But you can see why this would take so long to make this journey and to go through all of this and how exhausting that would be. And Paul is not, you know, the oldest of old, but he's also not the youngest of young at this point either. And I imagine you get hit by stones at least once, you probably don't walk the same like you used to, and it's probably not as comfortable as life used to be. But Paul, in his conviction to preach the gospel and for God in his hand, in working the kingdom to spread, is making this happen, that his kingdom will continue to spread. Verse 23 is a very short transition in Acts chapter... 14, remember, you have the end of the first journey, and then you have a whole chapter that's in between the first and the second. And Acts chapter 18, verse 22, is the end of the second missionary journey or the second preaching trip. Verse 23 is immediately getting ready to join up into the next one. So that's where we'll pick up next week. We are five lessons away, if I'm remembering my math correctly, from ending this particular series of studies about history and geography. We'll do some final work on Paul over the next few lessons about Paul's third missionary journey and some of the things that happened on that trip. What's going to happen after the third missionary journey? Paul goes back to Jerusalem at the end of this trip, and then where does he go, ultimately?
to Rome. Maybe not how he expected to go to Rome, but he finds himself on his way to Rome. We'll talk about that. We'll do a review of Paul and of Acts. I think we'll do a New Testament review, and then there's a general review, if I'm remembering correctly as well, just to give some thoughts along the way. I know that's the first bell, but that's all that I have for this morning. And so give some chance to visit, to speak with one another a little bit extra. Uh, so just know that, that those back halls are still meeting for another five minutes or so. But I appreciate your comments and your attention. We'll continue with our uh, third journey, Lesson 48, next week. Thank you.